church, take your Bibles this morning to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 will be our text this morning. I'm so excited about today and all that God is doing in his church, how he's building his church here at Calvary Riley. And I want to encourage you that what we're witnessing right now is a movement of God. It has nothing to do with any one of us, but we're experiencing the blessing and the power of God. And you know, man can do a lot of things. Man can build things, but only God builds his church. And he, does, he doesn't need our help, but he uses men and women like you and me. He uses uh, students and, and, and kids, youth of our church, to fuel the, the mission of God. And as we get on board with what God is doing, he begins to, to, we begin to take ground for the kingdom of God. And we begin to see God do supernatural things in the process You know what the same thing is true for the devil this morning? The devil can use any one of us if we'll allow him to. Let that sink in for just a second. If we're not careful, we can be used by the the Lord and by the Holy Spirit for the cause of the kingdom of God. But if we're not careful, we can also be used by the devil and allow the devil to use us to destroy the work of God. So we've got got to be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. We've got to allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through our lives. What we're experiencing right now is a move of God that many churches never see. Let me encourage you to get excited about all that God is doing and to jump in with both feet and and plug in, allow God to use you. Don't sit back and be a spectator. Let me encourage you this morning to get involved because that's where you begin to see the power of God on display. When when you jump in and allow God to use you, you get to see firsthand what God is doing and and the, 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 the prayers that are answered. You get to see the growth of what God does in and through our lives. And so let me encourage you to get some skin in the game this morning. Jump in and allow God to use you for his glory. We get to be a part of all that God is doing in building his church. And for those that have been sitting on the sidelines for some time watching God work, it's time to make an impact. It's time to invest. It's time to, to join us. And so for some today, your next step is to get saved and it's to, to say, yes, Jesus, I believe you love me, that you died on the cross for my sin and, and, and accept what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. For some, that next step is to get baptized and, and, and be an example for others and say, I believe that Jesus died and I'm not ashamed of what he did on the cross and his death, burial, and resurrection. For some, that's joining the church and saying, I want to be a part of what God is doing and I'm going to plug in and, and, and make some roots here. So for some, that's joining a small group and, and beginning to grow in that community. For some, it's to find that place of ministry and begin to serve and allow the Holy Spirit of God to use you. As Wake County, as the the Raleigh area explodes in growth, let me encourage you, don't sit back and just be a spectator and and say, well, every once in a while, I'll, I'll get excited or I'll show up, I'll do God a favor. No, it's time to jump in and say, God, what do you want to do through me to help build the kingdom of God? What do you want to do through my life to help reach our community with the gospel of Christ. I want to encourage you to be here tonight for our vision night. Tonight we will dream, we'll dream big about what God is doing, what he is accomplishing, what the future is going to look like here at Calvary. And we're going to talk about what that looks like for us and how we can plug in in the process of making disciples. And we're going to see numbers on those that have been saved, those that have been baptized, Those that have been added to the church, attendance over the last year, what God has been doing. We're looking at the financials of the church, how God is providing for his church. You'll also see what God is doing through our mission efforts locally and and globally. You'll also see some new building plans, and I think there's going to be a a picture that's showing up on the screen if it's up here. Uh, You're going to get just a glimpse, but tonight you're going to get a video tour of the new facilities and what they're going to look like and how... God is, is exploding his church with growth for the glory of God. And we want to encourage you, make a priority to be here tonight. Uh, Pastor Matt's bragging on his chili, but I'm telling you, uh, he was telling somebody before the service about it. And, he, and, and as soon as he walked away, she was like, that's nothing. <laughs> we are going to take him down. I mean, like, and, and so just know it's going to be on tonight uh, and we're going to have a, a fantastic time. 
But let me encourage you, come out. Use it as an opportunity to get to know people. Uh, build relationships. Talk to people that you don't know and, and get excited. We're going to be having a season of prayer. We've been waiting for permits for a new parking lot for over a year. All right. So you want to see how the devil works. The devil does not want the church of Jesus Christ to, to move forward. He does not want us to grow. In fact, I was listening to a, a pastor friend in South Carolina. He said, we have built buildings. We have added on to buildings. We've remodeled buildings. He says, nothing has been as stressful as trying to build a new parking lot outside of our building. And he said, same thing. It's been over a year. He said, we've been, it's been held up over and over and over. This, this evening, we're going to have a, a season of prayer, praying that God moves through the town of Fuquay and we get those permits in the next few days. Folks, we have Easter is a month from now, five weeks away. We're praying that God uses our church to impact this part of our city and this part of Wake County and the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're going to hear about uh, the new building plans and see the opportunities. We're going to pray over those. We're going to pray over the new mission opportunities that God will afford us to do this year. I truly believe the best is yet to come. God has some amazing things. In fact, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you believe that, church? God has a plan. If we'll allow him to, he will use us as part of that plan as he builds his church. And what God is doing will make the devil angry this morning. He hates when the church is growing. He hates when people are being saved. He hates when people are being discipled. And he hates when people take their next step in the growth process. He hates seeing people baptized and joining the church. In fact, he wants nothing more than to sideline the people of God Get them stirred up in turmoil and, and strife and so that they're rendered useless for the kingdom of God. This morning, we're reminded, though, the gates of hell, church, the gates of hell will not prevail against Christ's church. He has a plan. We are the plan for reaching our world with the gospel. And we're going to get a glimpse of that New Testament church this morning in Acts chapter 2. We'll see evidence of the Spirit's work and what it looks like in the New Testament church and, and a church where the Spirit is alive. I, I remember when I was in college, there was a church about an hour outside of Jacksonville, and they were known for lively worship. And uh, uh, they were way off the beaten path. I mean, you had to want to go there to get there. I mean, there was no major roads going there. But their, their, mo their uh, uh, model or their, their motto that they would say, where the Spirit's alive, it's worth the drive. And, and, uh, and I watched as, as God was working in that church. And it didn't matter that they were way off and on a country road in the middle of nowhere. Folks, when God is at work, He doesn't need us. But he'll use us as part of that process as building his church. And when the Spirit's moving, folks, we ought to not be uh, surprised at the work of God. It ought to energize us as, as God begins to move in our midst. A church that's leading and creating disciples of Jesus. Let me invite you to look at the word of God in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, for the promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. With many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. How appropriate uh, is that in context of where we live today, all right? Uh, if you watch what's happening every single day, it's more insane today than it was yesterday. And folks, I just want to give you the 411. It's going to be more insane tomorrow than it was today. Because folks, it's not getting better. It's getting worse. But we know this is not the end. God has a plan and a purpose for his church. And it says those, that, those who received his word were baptized. They were added that day about how many souls, church? Three souls. Three souls? Three thousands. Okay, I'm sorry, I misheard you. No, we saw three saved a few, four saved a few Sundays ago. 
But he says there 3,000 souls were added to the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers, and all came upon every soul. Why would all be upon the early church? They were standing in awe of the presence of power of Almighty God on display as they watched the Spirit of God move through their midst and begin to transform lives. People were standing, and I can imagine just the tears that were flowing down people's faces. And folks, when you see the power of God at work, you can't sit there and take credit. It's just one of those moments where, like, we got to be present. We got to see what God was doing. He was transforming lives. All came upon every soul. Wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings, distributing to the, the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day. Those who were being saved. Holy Spirit, would you, for the next few moments, just arrest our attention. God, I pray that any distraction of this afternoon or the chili that we're cooking for tonight or the desserts that we're making or excitement about the week or maybe a fear or worry about the future. God, would you just help us to lay that at the foot of the cross this morning? God, would we focus on your word and your power to transform our lives? Lord, where the church, where the spirit is moving, God, we want to experience all that you have for us. God, we want to be a church that's in line with where your Holy Spirit is at work. And, and God, we want to experience your presence and power this morning. And God, I pray even now you would speak to hearts of those who do not have a personal relationship with you. God, would you convict them of their sin and draw them to your, say, your son and salvation. And God, would this morning be that moment where they confess you as Lord and Savior. God, for the child of God who maybe has been a spectator, of, that they're, they're a part of the family of God, but they've never plugged in, they've never jumped in, they're, they're not moving forward in their relationship with you. God, would you speak to their heart? God, I pray this morning with you that moment of decision where they say, I'm ready to jump in. God, I'm ready to, to have experience all that you want to do in my life and in the life of our church. God, energize us. God, utilize us for your service. God, would you use us this morning to prepare our hearts for what you're going to accomplish. We'll get, be careful to praise you and give you all the honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. I love God's people said, amen. amen. I want to remind you as you're leaving the service this morning. There is a host of resources we've given out over the last several Sundays on evangelism. If we talk about proclaim, don't leave those back. Put, grab some of those. Uh, I love the testimonies of how God has been using you to share and have gospel conversations. And some in Spanish, some in English, some in Portuguese, different languages. Stop by. There's a whole host of those out there at the welcome desk. Imagine this. Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. His first and best sermon, his greatest sermon, and keep in mind, this is the same person who right before Christ was crucified denies even knowing Christ not once, not twice. He curses God three different times as he's saying, I don't even know who he is. I have no idea who you're even talking about. This is the one who stepped out of the boat in faith and then took his eyes off the Lord and began to seek there on the, on the Sea of Galilee and began to seek. And yet, this is the one God uses on the day of Pentecost at the birth of the New Testament church. You know what this reminds me? God's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for broken people. He's looking for people who are sold out for Jesus Christ who are saying, God, I don't have anything, but Lord, what I do have, I offer to you as a sacrifice. And God, if you can use me a part of your church to help build the kingdom of God, he's not looking for perfect followers, 
He was working for faithful people who were saying, God, here am I. Use me. Send me. Peter called people to repent of their sins in verse 38 in order to be saved. What happened next was a mighty move of the Spirit of God. The Word tells us 3,000 souls came into the kingdom of God and placed their faith in Jesus. A church where the Spirit moves is faithful in certain practices that brings tremendous growth by the Holy Spirit. We're looking at that this morning and what those practices are. We see the teaching of the Word in verse 42. The entire movement began with a Christ-exalting sermon. And what happened next was a direct result of the Word of God and the Spirit of God at work. 3,000 people got saved. Don't ever underestimate what God can do in his church. Don't ever underestimate it. Sometimes I think we limit God. Well, God, if, if you could just, and we're praying in, in man-sized dreams. But God has something far greater if we would just trust him, if we would just rely on him, if we would lean on him. The word was the most important thing. Our devotion to the word of God, the teaching, the study of the word of God informs everything else that we do as a church. In fact, verse 42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to the preaching of the word of God. They saw the importance, the value of the word. They were these disciples, Peter and the others were faithful to teach the word of God. This was not their thoughts, not their ideas but rather what the Word of God said. And folks, as pastors and teachers, we're committed to preaching and teaching the Word of God. But ever, however, though, as a church member, you and I each have a responsibility on our own to be digging into the Word, to, to be soaking in the Word of God. And folks, it's called personal worship. In fact, when we talk about our, our values as a church, that celebrate and you say, well, hey, pastor, I come to church on Sunday. I want you to preach the word and, and I'm going to praise the Lord. That's great. That's, that's awesome. But folks, what's happening on Monday through Saturday? What's happening in our personal worship? It ought to be an extension, folks. When we gather on Sunday, it's like, man, God's been working me over. He's been convicting me of sin. He's been showing me areas of my life that I need change. And as God is rough, roughing me up, so to speak, through his word, he's working out those kinks, working out those rough edges. He's causing me to come in line with his word. See, he convicts me of sin. He redirects my step as a follower of Jesus. Folks, we begin to follow him more closely as we spend time in his word. That personal growth helps fuel our corporate worship. You see, what happens is the person who gets to church and they look around, they're like, what's so ex everybody's so excited about today? <laughs> you hadn't talked to God since the last time you were in church. You see, what happens is if you only talk to your spouse on Valentine's Day, February 14th, the boy, I gave her flowers and chocolates and a card and, and dinner. You know where we went for Valentine's Day? We went to like three Goodwill stores, and we ate uh, hot dogs or uh, hamburgers from a char grill in our car. And, and my wife is like, this is the best Valentine's Day date ever. I mean, but I was speaking her love language, and I was like, I really wasn't thinking this was a date. I mean, we were just having fun, and we were just spending the day together. But she was like, that was my favorite thing because we did something that we enjoy together. And I was like, wow, I mean, that's like the cheapest date ever when you can shop at Goodwill and eat a uh, hamburger out of a, a tray in your car, you know. I mean, it was so romantic. I mean, all, I was checking all the boxes, you know. So some of you are wondering, you know, uh, I, got, I, I lucked out because I didn't need to fine dine her with all the fancy things of this world. It was just a hamburger in the car. And a trip to Goodwill. Who knew? I mean, but the reality is if I only talked to my wife on Valentine's Day, you would say your love life, your relationship is not very deep. The disciples understood 
the importance of the teaching, the study of the Word of God was vital to their health. And church, if they were ever going to reach these 3,000 new souls who came to faith in Jesus and discipled them, they had to be in the Word of God. What took place with the original 120 on the day of Pentecost grew as the Holy Spirit began to work. Folks, over 3,000 came to faith in Jesus. I don't know of a church anywhere that can handle 3,000 new converts at one time. I don't know a church anywhere in all of the world that can handle 3,000 new converts. I remember we were the first time I was in Pastor, with Pastor uh, uh, Bobby Harrell in India, 2012. I've told you about when we hiked across the mountain, and, and Steve, you've been to India, you know, uh, you know where I'm talking about. But that first time that I went with Pastor Bobby, our group had gone off to this other uh, in ring, this, this village, and we came back down the mountain, and we... we, we Connect, reconnected with the rest of our group, and that night in a rice paddy, over 5,000 people gathered in this massive citywide crusade in Palel. As, the, as the, the worship was going, I think we sang that first song that you sang to this morning. We were singing that song and, and lifting our voices in praise to the Lord. And Folks, what happened that night was the Holy Spirit's power descended upon this small farming village, small farming community. And that night, over 2,000 people named Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I was sitting there, Steve, as, as the invitation didn't last five minutes, it didn't last 50 minutes, it lasted over two hours. And I'm sitting here going, if we were in America, one, we would probably never experience this. But number two, everybody would be so mad. They'd be, uh, the pastor went so long, I was late. To, we, the Methodists beat us to lunch. I mean, I'm going to be late to lunch. And here they were. They were no one was getting upset. And literally, we were waiting as the lines were so long of people would come to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. And, and we would be dealing with three to five or six people at a time sharing the, the gospel and, and listening to them pray and, and invite Jesus Christ into their heart and life. And folks, it was, was at one point I just pinched myself going, is this real? Could this possibly be just a glimpse of what happened in Acts chapter 2 as the early church saw 3,000 people come to faith in Christ? That night, as all of these people got saved, you realize we had to help plant multiple churches in and around that village because the churches that were there were so dead. They were so out of touch with the Holy Spirit of God that they would have never discipled or reached any of them and helped them move forward in their faith. And folks, I, I sat there and thought about what was happening. Suddenly, now in this, in this text, the pools of Jerusalem are clogged with over 3,000 people wanting to be baptized. Wanting to say, hey, I want to publicly profess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Notice the phrasing here. He says, they voted, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. It understands a single-minded devotion to a certain course of action. They focused... On the word. Where are our basketball fans in the room this morning? Basketball fans, you can't live in the, in the triangle and not like basketball. I mean, if you move to North Carolina, you have to pick a team. You can't be neutral. Uh, when I hear someone say, I, I pull for Duke, I'm like, you're not from here. Because no one from here pulls for Duke. But anyway, I digress. But you go ahead and choose the light blue team. Uh, you know, God played in the whole entire sky, Carolina blue. So just go ahead and start pulling for them. But anyway, I'm, 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 I'm clicking on you. But the reality is, is when you think about basketball and you see a, 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 an arena, a coliseum that's filled with Thousands and thousands of fans, and imagine it's late in the second half of the game, and, and there's a foul, and all of a sudden, here's one of these basketball players. They step up to the line, and they they, they look up, and they they dribble the ball a couple times, and then they they raise their hands, and they go and they release it. In the background, 
are literally hundreds, if not thousands of people behind the, the, the back uh, backboard back there. And they're screaming and they're jumping up and down. And I saw recently where there was a, a scene where they were cutting people's hair with, 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 shade, with razors and stuff behind them while they were shooting the basket. I don't know if anybody else saw that. I was like, what in the world is the purpose? They were trying to distract the ball player. But what, how is it that they can be up there with all of that commotion and sink two shots and make it almost, in fact, a, a good ball player can hit 80% at the free throw line. How is that even possible with all of the screaming, all the noise, all the, all the commotion going on? Folks, it is in every fiber of their being. They have focused so much on their craft. Folks, it's called years of devotion to their craft. They've practiced those shots thousands of times. The same is true for the church. As we're involved in teaching the word of God, nothing should distract us from the number one priority of the church is to teach and study the word of God. Consider this, there were 12 disciples at this point, and now they have a church of 3,000. I mean, talk about overwork. Matt, you're not going to sleep at home ever again. I mean, you'll be at church 24-7. I mean, Jackson, you may see your son if you go back to the nursery. But other than that, you're probably not going to see him because it is literally, it's on. All of these people, they're hungry for the word. And being filled with the spirit, being filled with God's word, go hand in hand. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 says, do not get drunk with wine. For that is debauchery. He says, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. With your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God in the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, what happens is where the Spirit of God reigns, a love for God's Word also reigns. These new believers had a hunger for the Word of God. And the backbone of a healthy church is a devotion to teaching and studying the word of God. We see, secondly, they were committed to fellowship. Here in verse 42, it says they saw the importance of having a faith community around them. They knew that this world is too difficult to do alone. They needed one another. You see, a healthy church has a, a good diet of God's word, but it also must have good fellowship. This is the first exercise of a healthy church. The Greek word here is koinonia. This word is not found in the, in the four gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's first recorded here in Acts chapter 2. The root idea is a commonness or a commonality. It's in the New Testament, Greek is referred to as koine Greek because it was the common Greek of the day. It was the street language of the people. So here in verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. Verse 44, all who believed were together and had all things common. Every time this word is used in the New Testament, it denotes some type of sharing, sharing an offering, a, a contribution, or sharing someone else's experience. This is what it looks like when the church does life together. You open yourself up to sharing your life with others. In church, our common bond is the gospel of Jesus. Jews and Gentiles found commonality in the gospel of Christ. Fellowship with one another is based off of our fellowship with the Father. In fact, the Word of God tells us in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also are to love one another. I love when I hear people talk about the relationships they form with their church family. Do you realize we have people that have said, Pastor David, the bond that I have with some of the people in this church is stronger than my own personal brother or sister. It's a stronger bond than even I have with my own family because sometimes, many times their family aren't, aren't followers of Jesus. 
And they're like, when I come to church, this is my family. God's given me a, a home. Many of you have moved here from all over the country or even around the world. And he says he's given us a family. And folks, we're to love one another. We're to encourage one another. We're to edify one another. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, it is grace, nothing but grace, that we are allowed to live in community with Christian beloved brothers and sisters. Church, may we never forget that. God could only put together this church. God could only build his church. And I think one of the most beautiful pictures of this is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I've preached on this passage a few times over the years. Is the Macedonian church had such a desire to give and to be a part of participating in an offering. And the word here is koinonia. They, they were very poor believers, but they're saying, can we participate in meeting the needs of other churches as they're seeking to reach the others with the gospel of Jesus? We see also there's a unitedness in worship. And the, their worship consisted of two things. The word says in verse 42, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And the prayers, he says, these things are so important. The breaking of bread is reference to the Lord's Supper. If you come on Good Friday, that evening, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. And we're going to remember the, the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross of Calvary. But folks, they, they considered all of these things. And it, the, I love it. In verse 46, it talks about how they're breaking bread in their homes. Now, this was a little bit different process. And, and this was, they were sharing as Baptists like to eat. Tonight we're going to gather and, and we're going to break bread as a church family around tables all over this building. But folks, the reality is, is as the church was growing, they enjoyed spending that time building community, worshiping together. Another way they worshiped was through their prayers. The text most likely suggested specific prayers, probably both Jewish and Christian prayers. Folks, as we grow in our worship we move closer to him. Our relationship intensifies. Verse 46 says, they went to the worship, to, to the temple daily to worship. It was a part of their everyday life. I love that. They prioritized the house of God. They saw the value of being together in worship. Keep in mind, the early church faced dire persecution. So they would rather gather regularly and pray and be encouraged with the word and fellowship. A healthy church is a praying church. Amen. I was reminded this week when someone said, hey, we were praying for a family member to receive Christ. In my small group, we were praying for a family member to get saved. And over the last couple of months, my loved one came to faith in Jesus and they said, that entire group was celebrating what God did in saving their soul. You see, what happens is, as we're dialed in as a, as a small group or as a congregation, as we're praying, as we're plugged in, you get to know the needs of one another. You start to see, hey, this person has a need. We're praying for that need. And when God answers prayer, the church rejoices. A healthy church is a praying church, a church that commits to praying. When you are praying for souls to be saved, for life change to take place, for the church to grow and make a greater impact on our city and world, church, we rejoice when God does just that. It shouldn't surprise us. It should energize us. Folks, what happens is when I see God answer prayer on your behalf, I rejoice because it strengthens our faith. It encourages us to trust God with even greater promises, with greater needs and struggles in our life. We're saying, God, I trust you. I know you're sovereign. I know you're holy. I know you own the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth of every land. God, I trust you with my problem. We see fourthly and lastly, they were also faithful in evangelism. The final practice is mentioned here in Acts chapter 2 of a healthy church is they are faithful in evangelism. Verse 47 says the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Do you realize that doesn't just happen? Doesn't just happen. All of these resources we've been putting in your hands, in fact, this one 
I forgot last week, I didn't have it in my Bible, but it was God's special plan for children. Mom and Dad, you're wanting to talk to your kids about the gospel? Get with, get with Miss Taylor. Get with Jackson. Allow them to show and give you resources to help teach your kids how they too can have a personal relationship with Jesus. Pick up some of these gospel tracks and and someone told me this week, say, yeah, I got this when I was talking to someone in my family and was sharing with them exactly what we were just learning in church. Folks, that doesn't just happen. It happens when we are faithful in evangelism, saying, God, I want you to use me. And I'm praying for opportunities to share my faith with those around me. R.K. Hughes said this, what happens in the church where the spirit reigns, if you can see this on the screen, where the spirit reigns, Believers relate to the word through teaching. Pay attention. When the, when the spirit reigns, believers relate to the word through teaching. Where the spirit reigns, believers relate to each other, koinonia, in fellowship, in, in community. Where the spirit reigns, believers relate to God through worship. Where the spirit reigns, believers relate to the world through what, church? Evangelists. You see, what happens is... As God is working through his church, we make an impact on our city. And folks, it begins to transform as lives are transformed by Jesus Christ. Our desire is this from just the beginning. We've already seen the Lord transform lives. We've heard gospel conversations that people are having. Folks, we ought to get involved and be faithful in evangelizing our city with the gospel. In the early church... There was a sense of awe at the presence of God. And there was a sense of holiness. And as I was studying this this week, they said it was much like the children of Israel. As they were in awe of the presence of God. I'm afraid somehow we have lost that sense of awe in the American church today. Because we don't see the power of God regularly at work in our midst. And we're, we're, we're looking around going, well, uh, I wonder who's going to show up today. Or I wonder if the pastor is going to speak a verse that I want to hear this morning. Or, I wonder if we're going to sing my favorite song. Or I wonder if we're going to hear this particular instrument played. I wonder if we're going to do Who ever thought it was about us? I wonder if my kid's going to get this prize in Kid City, or if they're going to have this craft at Easter, or if we're going to get an Easter egg that has a dollar in it instead of a, a piece of candy. And you know what? I saw some kids walking around the last couple of years. They'll open, they'll pick up some Easter eggs and it didn't have the right thing on the end of it. They just throw it on the ground. I mean, just throw, throw it on the ground. I was like. What is wrong with us? We've gotten so consumed with, with the consumer church. The reality is, church, we ought to be so in awe of who God is and what he's doing that we are literally spellbound at what God is doing in our midst. Church, may we never get so used to seeing people saved and life transformed that we just become, it becomes, plus, just life is normal. It's autopilot. I just kind of come to church. No, it ought to ra- revolutionize our worship, our walk, our evangelism as we come to know God. And folks, we ought to see people added to the church regularly such as should be saved. Say, Pastor, what's the application? I want to ask you this morning, how are our vital signs as a church? I had a, I mentioned a few months ago, I went to a, an annual physical and I dread that day every year. I mean, I just do. And, and so, uh, you know, you, you about starve yourself to death for like a week before you go to your annual physical. And it's kind of like I, I floss my teeth the night before I go for my dental, you know, appointment. And my wife's like, you're not fooling anyone. I mean, they know you don't floss. I mean, the very second she gets in your mouth and your gums start bleeding, she was like, she knows you don't floss on a regular basis. I'm like, well, at least chunks of food aren't hitting her mask. So I'm going to take care of that. But you know, we, we do all this. We, we, and so we get to the, 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 we get to the doctor and I take everything out of my pockets 
I mean, I, I'm taking my shoes off, my coat off. I'm like, I'm trying to unload every weight we can possibly. I mean, short of being there in my, in my birthday suit, I'm going to, you know, take it, all those things off and say, I just want to have the lowest weight possible. And, and I don't know about you, but I get in there and they take your blood pressure. I get nervous just because they're, anybody else like that? And it says, well, hold on. We're going to take your blood pressure in about 10 minutes, all right? They come back around and it's normal. You know, but uh, whatever that is, that's just setting on the dryer. But how are your vital signs this morning? How are our vital signs? Folks, the, the, as we consider the church and all that God is doing, how is our biblical nourishment? Do we understand the gospel? Are we sitting under the authority and teaching of the word of God regularly and humbly? Are we making the word of God a priority in our personal worship? Secondly, are you having good Christian fellowship with brothers and sisters in your church? Are you invested in discipleship of others? Are you building deep relationships with others where you can grow and help others grow to know Jesus Christ? Community is a two-way commitment. I wonder this morning, are you prioritizing weekly worship? Or is it something you come when there's nothing else better to do? You say, well, Pastor, we're here this morning. You're preaching to the choir. Do you realize that everyone showed up every Sunday? We couldn't contain them all in three services. The new normal for regular church attendance Post-COVID is one to two Sundays a month. I, I'm just saying, what, what's our vital signs look like? Are we prioritizing weekly worship? Are we excited about gathering with our church family? Are we celebrating all that God is doing? Or are we devoted to prayer? How are we doing it sharing the gospel with those in our own network? Or are we being like Philip who prayed for opportunities and then seized them when God opened the door? I wonder this morning, what is holding you back? Why not confess that to the Lord and get back in the game? Get some skin in the game. Imagine what God can do through his church that's fully engaged, fully invested in making disciples of Jesus do you realize the city of Raleigh would be transformed as we seek to allow the Holy Spirit to move in our midst? Let me encourage you, do not miss tonight. As we celebrate the, the goodness of God and dream about all that God has planned for his church, let me challenge you to be here. Let's pray that God does such a move in our hearts that we leave energized, encouraged, and prepared for the ministry God has called us to do. Holy Spirit, would you, would you speak to our hearts this morning?